Hey everyone, welcome to an introduction on OAuth 2.0. In this mini-series, we're going to be talking about what exactly OAuth 2.0 is, why it was created, we'll show examples of OAuth 2.0 being implemented, as well as discuss how to protect your API endpoints using OAuth. Alright, let's go ahead and kick this off with something that you've probably already seen before. Now, chances are, if you've seen this screen before, then you've already come into contact with OAuth 2.0. And what's happening in this example is Spotify is asking me for access to my Google account. Now, the reason for that is because Spotify has a functionality that allows me to find out which of my friends are active on Spotify. Now, I can go and find out, you know, information about their playlists. I can find out, you know, which songs they're currently listening to um, and, you know, a whole bunch of other things. Now, that's the question. How does Spotify know who my friends are? Well, that's where OAuth 2 comes into play. So Spotify is going to give me the option to log into my Google account. Now, it's very important to note here is I'm not giving Spotify my Google username and password. Instead, I'm being sent over to Google to sign into my Google account. Or more specifically, I'm being sent over to Google's authorization server to sign into my Google account. Now, once I sign into my account, I'm going to be asked to allow Spotify to see, edit, or download my contacts. Now this here is called the scope of my resource request. So I'm not giving Spotify access to, you know, go and delete my account entirely. I'm not giving them access to find out information about my emails. I am just giving them access to my Google contacts because pretty much, you know, that's all they need, right? Now it's very, very important to note here about OAuth 2 is I'm not giving Spotify my Google username and password. The very important thing to note here is Spotify is sending me over to Google to log into my Google account. And then after I give Spotify permission to access my contacts, I can go ahead and enjoy their services. Let's go ahead and define OAuth 2.0 using that working example that we just saw using Spotify and Google contacts. Now taken straight from OAuth's website, OAuth 2.0 is defined as an authorization framework that enables a third-party application to obtain limited access to an HTTP service. Now Spotify is that third-party application and Spotify wanted to give me information about which of my friends were active on their application. Now the way that they do that is on behalf of the resource owner, who happens to be myself. And a handshake process called an approval interaction occurs between myself and Google Contacts, where afterwards, once I'm authenticated with Google Contacts, Spotify is now granted that resource and is able to give me information about which of my friends are active on their application. Now, if you recall back to that example, Spotify did not ask me for my Google password. Instead, Spotify sent me over to Google's OAuth server where I authenticated myself and then I was sent back to Spotify. Now that separation between Spotify and Google contacts is what is called the approval interaction. And that necessarily is what makes OAuth 2.0 OAuth 2.0. Accessing shared resources has always been significant on the internet way before OAuth 2.0 was even invented. Now you might be asking yourself, how did these companies even do it without OAuth? Well, what you're looking at here is actually a real life example of how Yelp was able to connect their customers with their Gmail contacts on their application. Now Yelp is requesting the user to enter their Gmail username and password. And then after you give them your credentials, they'll do some back end work and then trace all of your Gmail contacts and compare that to which of those emails that they have registered on their site. Now you have no real guarantee that Yelp isn't throwing your credentials or even worse, performing any other operations using your Gmail account. Thankfully, with OAuth 2.0, you do not have to do that. You do not have to give your credentials to a third party application to access those shared resources. But at the same time, it's super important to understand that this was the only real way that this functionality could have been given without OAuth. And people 
were super, super happy to hand over their credentials to applications such as Yahoo and even Facebook. And finally, this leads us to why OAuth 2 was created to begin with. OAuth was created as a solution that allowed applications to access shared resources on behalf of a user without requiring that user to hand over their passwords to random applications. OAuth keeps users secure by forcing them to enter their password in only one authentication server. So what that means is, if I'm logging into a third-party application with my Google account, then I'm not giving that application my Google password. Instead, I'm being sent over to Google, entering it there, and then coming back to that application already logged in. Lastly, OAuth 2.0 is an open framework standard for authorization. Now this means that absolutely anybody can implement this in their web app or application. Now that we've defined OAuth 2 in the context of a real world example, let's use that same Google Contacts and Spotify example to better understand what's going on under the hood in what's called the OAuth 2 flow. As the resource owner, I want to give permission to Spotify to access my Google Contacts to give me information about which of my contacts are active on Spotify. So what I'm first going to do is go ahead and click on that connect with Google Contacts button on Spotify. After I've done that, I'm going to be sent to Google's authentication server. Now keep in mind this can be any authentication server, it could be Facebook's OAuth server, it could be Twitter's OAuth server. Um, it could be any authentication server, in this case, it's accounts.google.com. As I'm being sent over to the auth server, the client's also sending over some information that the user doesn't necessarily see when they're authenticating themselves. So the two pieces that are mentioned here are the redirect URI and the response type. Now the redirect URI is just telling the auth server where to send me after I've authenticated myself. And the response type is dictating the grant type that the client's going to be using in order to reach those requested resources, which in this case is the Google Contacts information for myself. Now we'll go into the different grant types in future videos, but in this case, the most common example is the authorization code grant, which means pretty much the way that the resource is being granted is through an authorization code, which you'll see in just a second. After authenticating myself, I'm going to be prompted to consent to allowing Spotify to access my Google contacts and see, edit, or delete my contacts on my behalf. Now, once I've consented to this, I'm going to be sent to the redirect URI, which is denoted at spotify.com slash callback. And I'm also going to be sent back with an authorization code as mentioned in my response type. Now the client can't actually do anything with this code, but it uses this code to go back to the authorization server to exchange it for an access token. Now this access token is what the client's going to need to access the resource server and in turn, get all of my Google contacts information. After receiving the access token, Spotify can now go to the resource server at contacts.google.com and access my contacts using the access token that was issued by the auth server. Contacts.google.com now provides the client with the information that I consented to and only that. So Spotify can now see, edit, or delete my contacts on the resource server, but they cannot access any other information using that access token.